Lovely. Well, I think we're going to start. Hello, everyone, and uh, a very big welcome to our online discussion and the launch of Rafael Nimajewski's new book, Biennials, The Exhibitions We Love to Hate. My name is Lucy Myers. I'm the Managing Director of Art Book Publishers, Lund Humphreys. And we're very excited that thanks to the wonders of Zoom, we've been able to bring together our author, Rafael Nimajewski, uh, who's joining us from Texas, um, and art historian and broadcaster Jackie Klein, who's here with me in London. Uh, they will be talking, of course, about Rafael's new book on biennials, which is now published and available worldwide, and is the first in a new series of critical texts about contemporary art and the contemporary art world being published by Lund Humphreys under the heading New Directions in Contemporary Art. And I'm very grateful to series editor Marcus Verhagen for originally commissioning the book from Rafael. The book offers a, a really fascinating and very accessible, readable grand tour of contemporary biennials from 1989 to the present, uh, which really brings out the huge variety of the biennial as an exhibition format. Um, and Raphael very deftly unpicks why responses to the biennial have become so polarised and um, we'll hear more about why, bi why he thinks biennials are the exhibitions we love to hate. Um, so Raphael and Jackie will be exploring some of the book's key themes during their discussion and also I think looking to the future of the biennial as an exhibition format in this uncertain post-pandemic period. We hope to have about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, please, if you have any questions for uh, Rafael or Jackie, please uh, use, raise them using the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and um, Jackie will pick them up at the end of the uh, formal discussion. Uh, as you can see from the slide on the screen, we are offering an exclusive special discount on the book to uh, participants in today's uh, book launch. Uh, to claim the discount, just go to our website, lundhumphreys.com and enter the code biennials20 to get 20% off the price of the book and free UK postage. And if you're in the US, you need to click on go to US shop on our website and then you can order the book in dollars with free US postage. And that special offer is valid until the 11th of July. I'm now very pleased to introduce our two speakers. Rafael Nimajewski is co-founder and director of the Biennial Foundation in New York and has written and lectured extensively on the subject of the Biennial, um, which is also the subject of his doctorate degree thesis from the Royal College of Art. He's worked as assistant and associate professor at Central St. Martin's Sotheby's Institute, the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, and as Programme Director for the MA in Curating at Chelsea College of Art in London. Outside academia, he has led projects for the Serpentine Gallery, Bergen Kunsthal, Manifesta and Documenta, and worked as Curator of Programmes at the Hayward Gallery and as Director of Programmes and Education at the New Bergen Museum of Art. Jackie Klein is an art historian, author and broadcaster. She worked as a curator at the Tate, the Courtauld and the Hayward Galleries in London before moving into art book publishing as commissioning editor at Thames and Hudson, Fyden and Tate and most recently as director of Henny Publishing. She is associate lecturer at the Courtauld Institute on their master's programme curating the art museum and has commissioned a number of books in the field as well as being an author herself of a number of best-selling art books. Um, so I think that's all set um, and I'm very delighted to hand over to Jackie to start the discussion. Thanks so much Lucy um, for that great introduction. I just have to apologise in advance if I occasionally mute myself Raphael because um, I'm in the top floor of our house and the rain keeps suddenly pounding down and it's so loud that I fear no one will be able to hear anything you say um, so if I do that that's why. Um, I mean your book is I think a really important uh, publication and there's lots of it that we're going to get a chance to talk about I'm sure um, but one thing I, I wanted to start on really is, is sort of right at the beginning the basics with some definitions I suppose you know how would you define a biennial it seems a really oversimplistic question in a way but 
um, interestingly, you write in the book that the kind of two yearly cycle of a biennial in a way is the least consistent of its characteristics. So for you, what are the parameters that make something a biennial? Uh, so as you said, the, the, I, I think, you know, it, the, I think that this is really where the beauty of biennials lies today is that, that it's still something that is very difficult to capture. And, and I always, you know, whether I talk to students or, or try to write something and make sense of it, uh, I find myself with that question, which is a very simple question, but what is a biennial? And there is also such a diversity, which, which is one of the main points I try to make in a book. And um, also working at the Biennial Foundation, trying to you know, describe our mission, et cetera. Um, I think for many years, I've been struggling you know, with that question. And then I've been also discovering that I, I and, and, and I think that this is one of the most exciting things is that the projects that I think are the most innovative and the most creative today, they happen on the fringes of that definition. Mm -hmm. So I think this definition is open. Obviously it requires many different parameters to be taken into consideration. I think there is the recurrence, which I think is probably the least important because uh, if you especially look at many biennials that have been now going on for 20 or 30 years, there are such irregularities that, you know, some of them are called biennials, but they're actually triennials. They've been, you yeah. know, recurring every three years. And now I think the pandemic, once again, when every single biennial has been postponed, so technically it's not longer a biennial. I, I, I think it's a generic term, and this is really how we've been using it for many years now without realizing that it's, it's, it's a generic term for an exhibition format that was really important in the 90s because it really provi uh, provided the first kind of valid alternative to large museum shows and also took art outside the gallery spaces, outside the museums, very often outside its buildings into the city. And I think that this is maybe the most important characteristics of these exhibitions is that they always have uh, site specificity, and, and I know that this is a concept that has been discussed for many years in relation to artworks, but not as much in relation to exhibition. I yeah. think biennials are site specific exhibitions. They always connect it very closely, whether you know, it's a physical site specificity to the building, to the city. Um, so I would say that this is very important characteristic. And the second one in relation with occurrence uh, is actually what I would call time specificity. The biennials are exhibitions about now. They're all about capturing the zeitgeist. You know, there are some historical exhibitions realized in biennials, but there's still exception and they, they're there to prove another point, but it's always about reading the, the present, making statement and about the present and also looking towards the future. They almost, they really are not concerned with the longer histories and art history the way museums are. So I would say that this is much more important than actually, you know, making sure that it takes place every two years or that it's a large scale show or it's that and it's that. I, I actually think that, again, that the most exciting things happen on the fringes. So they, they may, you know, be annual, uh, they may uh, be called festival or art summit rather than biennial. So I also wouldn't, I would be very careful uh, you know, uh, assuming that everything called biennial is a biennial and vice versa. Yes, no, you're right that we shouldn't be too caught up with that. Um, I was going to say, if you want to, you can jump off your screen share. I know you've got some images that we might come to, um, but I know it can give a nicer view for people of uh, your lovely face in Texas. Um, I suppose one of the big things that you do talk about that you really tackle head on in the book uh, is this idea of the kind of the pros and cons, if you like, of biennials, uh, particularly the kind of cons, I suppose. Um, I mean, typically, I suppose those in favour of biennials have always talked about them promoting economic benefits to the places that they spring up in. They can promote pluralisation and diversification of culture, which is obviously increasingly, we're all aware, very, very essential, that they can allow a much more progressive interrogation in particular of non-Western artists, that they can generate passion for the arts. But you talk a lot, obviously, about the flip side, about what the skeptics have written over the years about biennials being economically indulgent or maybe not helping local communities or being a kind of artistic touring circus. 
I suppose I'm interested in, I mean, you call them one of your basic arguments is that biennials are, you say, the undeserved anathema of the contemporary art world. And I'm really interested in why you think that is. What is it about biennials that has attracted so much um, of the maybe more generic criticisms that could be leveled at the art world? Oh, this is a tricky question because I, you know, I, it's very difficult and I cannot really, I don't think I have the level of knowledge and reflection to kind of deep dive into the psyche of contemporary art world and why they picked biennials to be the ones that everybody likes to pick on. But there is definitely, as I was, you know, I've been, I've been sort of visiting and researching and reading biennials now probably for 25 years and I've seen uh, the increase in criticism and at some point reaching the levels that, that I just found really annoying. And I am also, you know, as I've been researching biennials progressively, I am becoming more and more critical myself. And I see a lot of problems, a lot of issues, but funnily enough, the ones that are mentioned the most are not the ones that I find are specific to biennials. So in a book, you know, I, I, I list sort of all the, um, problems that, that the critics usually bring uh, uh, in different chapters. I, I try to really be very systematic, look at this criticism. But the big point that I'm trying to make is that most of them actually, there is a lot of very, very kind of legitimate uh, criticism going on, but most of this criticism is really not specific to biennials if we look at it. So yes, it, I mean, you, talk, you talk about things yeah. like globalization, the homogenization of culture, um, yeah, kind of uh, the lack of diversity, sometimes money, power. These are obviously issues that are swirling around all Absolutely. different parts of the art world. Absolutely. But for some reason, I think also biennials, you know, because they haven't been that established in the 90s, even in early 2000s, it was still something new in the mm -hmm. art world that was growing. The importance of them was growing, the, their prominence and the role that they actually play within the whole ecosystem. Yet, you know, it's probably a little bit easier to kind of write a, quite a, you know, uh, unglamorous review about, about a show somewhere in Asia than, you know, a show at Tate or MoMA. So, I mean, I, I also don't want to speculate here, but, but what I notice is, for example, um, and, and, and the term bionalization that been, that been coined, for me, this term is not an innocent term. It always has very strong connotation, you know, when people want to talk about many biennials around the world, we can say proliferation of biennials, we can say a lot of different things. When critics use that term biennialization, it's usually, you know, it's same as the globalization or, yeah. or cultural. It has so many connotations and unfortunately a lot of them are, are, are negative. And, uh, and something that I also, also thought I, is, I thought yeah. it was really interesting that you quote um, uh, the New York critic, Peter Sheldahl calling biennials festivalism. I mean, there's a lot, yeah. you, you cite really interestingly some of the, the sort of the critiques that have emerged in the last 10 years or so, even as you say, interestingly, from some of the curators themselves who've then either previously or then go on to curate biennials like yeah. Dan Birnbaum. I know, you know, at one point said the biennial is dead and then just the next year himself curated two biennials. Biennial. So, I mean, it also seems that there is a sort of a kind of slightly self-lashing uh, that goes on within the art world of sort of always pushing the radical and finding there, sometimes these exhibitions are wanting. There is. And I thought what was also really interesting is that even, and it continues, I hope it's going to start now as we exit the pandemic, uh, every pretty much, I would say 90% of reviews of biennials, the critic always feels compelled to open it with, there are now over 300 biennials around the world. Can you actually, you know, find a, a large museum uh, review today that opens, there are that many by museums around the world and museums produce that many shows. I think we also reached a critical mass but it really doesn't make any sense anymore. It's not helping anybody. It's not really illuminating anything about the biennials, about the particular biennials, about biennials as a whole, to keep kind of making those statements, which very often, you know, the underlining is there are too many biennials. And, and, and I think this is something again, that for me kind of has to stop. I just cannot read these reviews. I cannot get to the first paragraph when I kind of see one of those statements is the biennials being mushrooming, booming, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And, uh, 
And I just think they reached the critical mass again. Now, going back to criticism such as festivalism, et cetera, I think a lot of it is actually funded. Biennials did, you know, they're not solely responsible for that because it's also, you know, those new spaces within museums. I think it all probably starts with Pompidou Center when they start those big, open, adaptable um, exhibitions in those spaces that can, you know, accommodate a, a, a very, very large scale works, yes. uh, such as or, or Tate Turbine Hall, etc. But it's true that biennials, because they took the art to the streets, a lot of it was public art and still is, it enabled artists to produce works of a scale that was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And I also think that because they're very large shows and shows like Documenta, you know, that, that some of editions require several days and the infamous uh, Documenta 11, when, you know, one of the critics quite rightly added the time of every video work that was in the show. And he came up with something like 11 days to see if you actually want to see every single work in the show. You know, you would have to spend in the show within the opening hours, 11 days. And, and, and it's true that that also introduced, and that definitely, and that's, that's a subject for another book, but that impacted the spectatorship and the way we uh, experience the exhibitions. A lot of critics, were, critics would say, if you wish, consume exhibitions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the fact that people do run through the exhibitions and, and, and and artists also are part of that attention economy, unfortunately, and, and we see a lot of words that are there, you know, in your face that scream, please stop and give me attention. So there is definitely that, and there is a lot of funded criticism there. But again, well, I, think, I, I don't think, yeah, I think it's very flattering for biennials to give them full credit for, for, for that, yes. you know. But, but as we've said, these are things that are factors of the contemporary art world. And it does seem to me that biennials, the biennials get a lot of bashing in the name of people who don't particularly like large installation art, which like most yes. art, small or large, can be really interesting or can be really ineffective and not very moving. Um, I mean, I'm interested to know what do you feel, you argue for this quite well in the book, I think, about why it was that biennials did suddenly have this moment or probably this decade or so of exploding in the 1990s. Just give us a little bit about that context because, and actually I don't know if you might want to share, I know you've got some interesting maps, but yes. obviously we've got the very earliest biennials incredibly now to think about it in the 19th century obviously Venice and Carnegie International in the very late 1890s and Sao Paulo in 51 but I mean maybe yeah share us share with us your maps and just tell us a little bit about why you think it is that suddenly there was an explosion of this exhibition form in the 80s and 90s. Yes so so it's historically looking I mean obviously uh, you know there are different genealogies that can be also drawn from, from for the biennials you know some of them that really draw on the modernist exhibition forms also universal exhibitions where, which which were not necessarily art exhibitions could include so there is a very long history there but what always you know interested me is is this proliferation and I think that this is really something that can be closely tied with political uh, events, you know, such as the changes in, in, in Europe that happened around 89, uh, but also the economic globalization, uh, those new trade agreements that really started developing on a completely unprecedented pace. Uh, you know, another thing, uh, that needs to be taken in consideration is definitely the, the advances in, in internet technologies and, and, and this new kind of feeling of, of uh, global village and living and being so connected. Um, and lastly, maybe also simply, you know, that how, how affordable suddenly travel became with the low cost airlines. I think this all contributed and impacted the art world. And I think the biennials perhaps were just very early manifestation. But, but I tried to also see, you know, a positive side of it, which, which for me was really about changing the cartography of contemporary art world, which at the time in the 80s, in the 70s, still revolves in those uh, big centers inherited from modernity. There is still Berlin, Paris, London, there is New York, it's very centralized. There is very little activity happening elsewhere. And with the biennials, and actually we can see that because now the art fairs follow, the museums follow, 
we see this amazing decentralization. And I think, you know, by areas such as Havana, Istanbul, which was introduced in 87, you know, Istanbul practically was not on the art map in the late 90, 80s. Uh, which now, is amazing, which a, is amazing to think now, because now it's think such of, a big yeah. center. But I think Istanbul Biennial comes, and Istanbul it's an amazing case because it's actually the venue that was used for one of the first editions, those uh, um, buildings over the Bosphorus, the Antrepot, they actually became a museum afterwards physically. The, the venue that was first used uh, for the biennial then becomes a museum. So there is, and, and then the whole ecosystem grows around it. It becomes a cultural district. So, so definitely th there is this redrawing of the cartography where suddenly we giving voice to what used to be peripheral. You know, I, I also really don't like to continue talking about center and peripheries because I think it's counterproductive for Eastern and Western Europe, you know, it, 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 try to be really careful with that. but. But it's really, you know, even within the the countries, let's if we say, let's say we take Western Europe, it again, it used to be sort of Paris, Berlin, London, suddenly you would have a biennial in the middle of nowhere, Sweden or Norway, which was very refreshing to actually see, you know, or or in south of Spain. Uh, so, so that decentralization happened on different scales. It's not only global scale. In order to fully comprehend it, we have to you know, also think about regions and and the way kind of how this new global city started uh, playing the game. And now I think we're probably going to take it one step further in the pandemics when all of us, you know, suddenly discovered that they can work from home, artists can, uh, can, can have, uh, do their work from home. And a lot of biennials are kind of rethinking that, but I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to see a further decentralization. And I think this is this is phenomenal. This is really something that we haven't seen and perhaps the, the biggest single contribution of biennials to the whole ecosystem i would say that that that's it yeah i mean that map that you're showing is amazing to see when it started in venice and now looking at that that global map it's incredible absolutely I mean, one one thing that you talk about really interestingly in the book is about how biennials you call it kind of serving or serving two sovereigns just thinking about audiences because this seems to be quite central to a lot of your arguments um, that the local public is obviously one incredibly important audience, often forgotten about um, in a lot of the debates, um, but that essentially, you know, biennials serve that local audience who for them, they probably want to see high profile major international artists who, as you argue quite rightly, may not get to that city or that region. And then you've got potentially the international visitors, that second audience who have, are maybe more familiar with because they are seeing those international um, artists in their places and what they want is to actually get a glimpse instead into the sort of underexposed local art scene and I suppose one question is do you feel that these two ambitions can ever be paired successfully and sort of squared if you like um, and if so can you give us maybe just one or two quick examples of, of the sorts of biennials that you think have catered really successfully to those two audiences, because it's quite a challenge. Absolutely, and uh, this is and this is another thing that you know that that it's really reading the criticism that that prompted my thinking when you know I I would read in a review that the critic was complaining that you know uh, there was like a, he's visiting a biennial in Moscow and he's saying well the, the works are really familiar you know there was like nothing new I mean I already seen that in other five biennials. And again, this sort of uh, a, a, a total what today would we would call tone deafness, yes. you know, uh, like lucky you that you've been to those five exactly, other biennials, exactly. but the locals might not have been have done that. Absolutely. So yeah. I think it's very tricky because because it's you know the, the the agenda of many biennials is to get the international exposure and is to kind of put yourself on that map that is being decentralized so so pleasing the critics and the international visitors is, is extremely important it's extremely important for the local governments who also want to you know make sure that this is part of their uh agenda of building tourism etc so uh but but there is there is definitely a contradiction there and and it's an interesting contradiction because the local audiences you know they they want to see Bill Viola. They want to see the, the blockbuster show that they would otherwise have to fly to London or New York to see. 
uh, while actually the international visitors, they want to discover the local art scene. And there are several um, recipes that, that, that could be uh, quoted here. Uh, I remember the first Moscow Biennial was actually really interesting. They had like two parallel exhibition. Uh, one was really the international exhibition. They actually even had went as far as having publishing two separate catalogs. And one was the international exhibition and they had the local exhibition that were actually quite apart they just happened in parallel and and were advertised together but they had several curators etc uh another really good um uh solution is actually having pairing a, a curator that really knows the local art scene mm -hmm. because i think this is always a challenge for international curators when they appointed they really don't know much about the city about the local art scene and depending how much time they have on their hands to actually move somewhere yeah. for several weeks if not months and do the research uh it's it's quite tricky so what i what and i always and even if they I, even if they do that they're sort of you know again they can quite rightly be, be critiqued for that slightly colonial approach of sort of swooping absolutely. in digging deep and then disappearing um absolutely and 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 today with having you know the artworks created in so many languages and coming and, and actually having so many voices and so much diversity, which is amazing. It's true that also just this notion of cultural translation becomes really the key. It's translating the messages, the works. And um, so I think what is usually very successful, what I really enjoy is the shows who kind of, when there is a team that includes uh, local curators, as well as those international curators who kind of connect the locality with the broader network. So rather than doing separate shows, they're actually trying to somehow uh, put them together. Uh, a successful example, I can tell you uh, the Istanbul Biennial, I think it was in 2007, Vasif Kurtun and Charles Ash curated together, it was actually called Istanbul, simply. Uh, they also did something really beautiful where uh, they used a lot of old residential buildings that were being redeveloped or being abandoned. Uh, so the exhibition spaces very often included windows. So you had the artworks, and then from time to time you had a pause and you were just, uh, you know, it was it was really about enjoying the, the views of the city, of our Bosphorus and discovering the city this way. Uh, and I, I thought that was one of the most, in that, in that sense, the most successful exhibition that I think it was exciting for, you know, both for international outside visitors as well as for local audiences. Yeah, I mean, that idea of which you touched on right at the beginning of the different spaces that are used for these exhibitions, I think in my experience too, uh, far less extensive than yours, and I'm afraid I have most yeah. to, the, to the regular track of things like Venice, but the most exciting moments often are where you have those engagements between idea, artwork and space and the city itself and that you're Absolutely. in a space that is so unknown behind the scenes unexpected different from the institutional yeah. places and and another solution that that, that we start seeing in biennials which is i will have to say one of my favorites and i think it produces shows that are really apart and 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 for me perhaps it's the most expensive to the most difficult to articulate actually um and, and describe them and show them i have a few pictures here from um Okayama Art Summit, that's probably one of the best examples that I'll try to share with you. Um, so this is this is the, the biennials, but it also happens elsewhere, uh, but that are fully curated and produced by artists only. And I know it's very controversial, curators probably not gonna be happy <laughs> to, to, to kind of not have an important place anymore within, within that, um, uh, within that format, but, uh, but Okayama, their first edition was Liam Gillick, who curated, mm -hmm. but I think they actually call it artistic director. Uh, the second one was Pierre Eeg, and, uh, and this is really the idea where the artist invites other artists, most of them that he already previously collaborated with. And, and the result is an exhibition that is really, you know, very close to some sort of total experience that that is exhibition and artwork at the same time i think those boundaries are blaring in this context completely uh the boundaries between particular artworks are blaring so here you can actually see those uh kids visiting the show 
Uh, but other people that you see their performance of Tino Sagal, I excuse myself, I know that Tino Sagal hates to, his works being photographed, uh, but, but they were just in the picture. So I had to take a picture and the work of Pamela Rosenkrantz who uh, put this uh, tide in the pool. And, and, and again, it just creates this total experience uh, where uh, I just never seen anything like that. You know, here you can see the sort of uh, scientific experiments, Barpieger Eag and Matthew Barney, uh, the, 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 the sort of a notion of, of dialogue and works being dialogical with an exhibition space really takes a brand new meaning because all the artists basically were there. They spent several weeks working together, living together on site, so the main venue, it's a it's an old abandoned uh, elementary school, and 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 this really produces an exhibition that touches upon all the senses. Uh, they even thought about they they came up with the system when there are little diffusers as the visitors walk through the space. Uh, there are smells that are being diffused, <laughs> just to enhance you know your sense of visit again. Uh, there is this kind of complete breaking of the inside and outside of the spaces. I mean, it's really something that I cannot describe and there is no pictures that will give justice to, to, to exhibition that it produces. And I think again, when we see something like that, when we witness something like that, that, that contradiction between the local and, 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 and outside uh, expectations completely disappears because I think all the visitors are just equally overwhelmed uh, with something that that you know that is difficult to comprehend. Again, it's for me this is the new genre of exhibitions that we haven't really seen. And I know that Pierre, you know, did his retrospective at Pompidou. So that also happens with institutions. I don't want to give Biennial sole credit for that. But we start seeing those artists curated uh, biennials. And I think it's really probably something that in 10 years we're going to consider as a genre apart. Well, in the same way that, you know, artists intervening in museum collections, which has been happening for at least 15, yeah. 20 years, is now very much an established genre of exhibition making in the institutional context. Um, I mean, and in my experience, even as a publisher, the very, very first book that I commissioned as a fresh commissioning editor at Thames and Hudson was um, pulled together by uh, the brilliant writer Simon Grant at Tate. And it was essentially about dialogues that artists have with other artists of the past. So he was asking artists to sort of, you know, delve into the studio and show him what they've got on postcards and on their walls. And, and you know, some incredibly wonderful moments of dialogue between artists. So in my experience, when you put artists in the driving seat, if they're really interesting, thoughtful artists who sort of engage with that medium, in this case, um, you know, the medium of the biennial, you're sort of only ever probably going to get interesting results, which is not to denigrate the role of, of professional curators as well, but I agree that it provides something rather different. I mean, you define, Raphael, in the book, I thought really fascinatingly, three different sort of types of biennial. So your book isn't just a sort of chronology of the shows that have happened and, and a, a name check of the cities that, that these forms now proliferate in. But I thought really interestingly, in the heart of the book, you look at these three kind of forms that you call oppositional, aspirational and engineered. And the oppositional one is, you know, very much about resistance, alternative views, the aspirational one, more about biennials as, you know, economic powerhouses and kind of drivers of soft power and change and boosting tourism. And then the engineered ones, which I expected you to completely rip apart, you know, these ones that you call kind of top down, often management consultant um, created spectacles and very often state sanctioned. I mean, maybe it would be lovely for you to say something briefly about these three forms, but maybe almost in a way starting with that most recent one of engineered, you know, because, yeah, I thought you were going to say, of course, these are terrible because they are top down. They're not grassroots initiatives. They're not radical. But actually, really interesting. Sure. You, you sort of argue that maybe we shouldn't be boycotting them as artists or curators or audiences. Maybe we should be encouraging them because they might end up being dynamic and unpredictable in new ways in the future. Maybe say a little bit about those ones first. Sure, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, this this kind of typology, I think it's something new that, that that I haven't seen. It's really my another attempt that I'm trying to make to just introduce more nuance in the whole discussion. And 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 very important point is that that what I try to make in the book that 
it's really not about kind of the bad, the good, you know, the ugly, uh, that, uh, that also biennials, and, and this is something we very rarely see. And, and, and I hope that research also that we, in the future will happen, will go towards that direction. It's looking at the institutional life of a biennial because we always talk about third edition of Havana, the 2009 Venice or Istanbul, et cetera. But those institutions, those organizations actually have the lifespans. And, and the point I'm trying to make uh, is that actually a biennial can start as a very oppositional and end up 20 years later as something that is all government owned and, and, and used for propaganda purposes, purposes to say the least. And the other way around, there may be something that is very engineered in the beginning. And, and I give very concrete examples actually in the book and I probably have, I just see if I have some slides. Yes, I have one of, you know, the biennials that is very often kind of quoted as, or used to be as kind of the, the, the example of this engineering. It was Singapore that, you know, that started with the IFN meeting, the kind of World Bank delegates, that there is the Formula One, it's part of the larger campaigns. Uh, promoting Singapore as a creative city. And what they did actually, I think it was for the second edition, very interesting experiment uh, in the main venue, which was Old City Hall, they put, you know, regular biennial show, large installation, and then they installed the, um, uh, the little art fair downstairs, which was really disturbing. And I never seen anything since like that, that you could actually buy the miniatures <laughs> the artworks, large installations shown downstairs. And, and I will never forget that, you know, I overheard visitors leaving and screaming that this is amazing. This is like Ikea, you know, it's the showroom upstairs and Marhead called downstairs. And you literally see how the beautiful the large installation is. And, and here you actually have one of the works uh, that you could purchase downstairs the miniature of. So, uh, Seven editions later, I actually think that Singapore is one of the most progressive, the most diverse and exciting biennials today. They just went so far away, emancipated themselves with, from those initial agendas. And I think that's why I would be very careful. You know, my belief is that if we're spending money, whether it's private or government on art, is good. And actually, so I'm not going to criticize millions yeah. spent on art because it could be spent on arms or elsewhere. Let's be careful when we jump into this criticism, you know, that this is like all engineer and it's all part of the propaganda. I think artists, curators, especially the experienced ones, can find the way to fight within the system and actually produce a very exciting show sometimes, you know, where uh, with something that was really uh, designed to be really you know, promoting a particular agenda of yes. whether it's a government or corporation, et cetera. So I'm just saying, you know, a lot of it obviously are kind of very blunt and examples of propaganda, but I would just always be careful and kind of give second thought. Uh, another example that I really like to show, so apparently this is, uh, this, this did not come to fruition, but it was part of the Sadiyad Islands now we know that Guggenheim is also probably not happened, but Louvre opened there in Abu Dhabi. And uh, I don't think a lot of people know that one of the parts of the project was actually a Biennale Park with a Biennale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this is something amazing because I was uh, approached by large consultancy, I think in 2004, with the questioners about all the questions, what is the most successful models from visitorship, et cetera. And then I actually was there to visit Sharsha Biennial. I made a trip to Abu Dhabi and I saw the show where I took all these pictures uh, presenting little models. And I was like, well, that sounds familiar. And then I made a connection that actually they all did all the research. They spent, I don't know how much paying consultants and all they came up with was a copy of Giardini. So I, I, that, I, I really just... no. I mean, I, I think that point you make really beautifully and subtly in the book, it does sort of blow open the debates, which have been incredibly binary, as you quite rightly say, um, not really to the sort of great intellectual advancement of our thinking about biennials. And, and as you say, you know, examples like Havana, which definitely started as radically alternative and resistant and incredibly political, very openly, 
then end up feeling like the establishment and having a grassroots opposition themselves because they end up, you know, yes. very much sort of in line with, with you know, much more uh, mainstream views. So I think that is a really interesting and subtle point um, that you make in the book. I suppose one question, you've sort of touched on it a little bit, but is, as much as you can define it, what is the relationship of biennials to the art market and has that changed in recent years? Uh, there is, it, it, it's an uneasy relationship, I would say. And again, this is something that I'm slowly kind of diving in more and more because I just been seeing quite amazing uh, developments. You know, something that I first realized is the actually occurrence of artworks. And I started tracing the artworks. I think it started with John Bach, who like first made an installation commissioned by the Lyon Biennale that made it to Art Freeze, then made it to Tate, or sorry, ICA in London. And, um, and I started, you know, something that, I mean, it's always such a delight to start kind of like tracing the movement of artworks. And I started seeing those patterns that there was kind of the biennial art fair institution uh, pattern. Uh, another pattern that I see that makes things even more complicated is what I would refer to as the biennialization of art fairs and art fairization of biennials. Mm -hmm. So uh, biennials being more open about relation, biennials, you know, as we know, openly accepting extra funding, even documenta. Uh, from public, uh, from private galleries, you know, on, on the basis that their artists is included. So there is no expectation for a gallery to kind of pitch in and to help with transport, et cetera. So there is definitely uh, biennials becoming much more open the way they, they describe also and speak about that relationship with art market and private. Uh, and then the art first started doing public programs, you know, with yes. Art Unlimited in Basel, we have curated shows that are completely independent from booths. So, so there is definitely a very interesting blaring happening. Yeah. And, and this is now becoming like a format, you know, that it's standard. We, we start accepting that we're going to go to an art fair, we're not only going to see the books, we're going to see the commissions, there will be a curated program of performances, there are film screenings. So there is definitely something happening when, where, where, and again, I'm just being an observer here. I'm not sort of putting any judgment on that, but, but there is definitely blurring of boundaries. And also, that, that also back, yeah. to, back to your very initial point in our conversation about how so much is leveled against the biennials and art form, which actually should, could and should be more rightly leveled against the art world if you want to make those debates, is that that blurring has happened increasingly in the last decade in all parts of the art world. So you have you know, auction, auction houses that are staging, you know, kind of more social gatherings and programs. You've got, I mean, personnel wise, you've got people moving in a way that they certainly didn't 20 years ago um, from the public to the private sector, back to the commercial sector and that kind of, you know, moving back and forth in and out of academia and the commercial art world. So I suppose it's not it's inevitable that the biennial being, you know, part of the living, breathing art world globally is also going to reflect some of those changes. Um, Absolutely. And, and even the acquisition of the institutions like there is definitely, you know, and, and I, 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 I'm personally not interested to it to the extent where I would, you know, trace the, the value. But I know there are people currently doing that. There is an organization in Germany that is really trying to come up with algorithms that create those trackers <laughs> that if artist is shown here and here, how much that's gonna increase the value of the artwork. So it, it's, and, and I think that uh, probably by the time they finish their algorithm, the digital, you know, the arrival of those new uh, forms that are now being traded will completely distort, the, the, disturb, you know, the whole landscape again entirely so so they will have to do another research project and maybe you know <laughs> and maybe it's good um i do want to turn over to give um, the people joining us in this webinar a chance to ask some questions in a moment but i just want to ask you um i mean there's so much more i could ask you maybe i'll get a chance in the questions too although i don't want to take over but um you do talk obviously about covid and and this book clearly was finished and starting to go through the production at lund humphreys as the um, pandemic hit. You say in the closing pages that the landscape of, of biennials is going to see really radical change. And you, you touch on some of those things, maybe the, the fact that there could be a focus more on the local rather than the global. 
um, and that whole idea of social betterment, maybe there are going to be more opportunities for it. I just, just to end on for me, I wonder where you see biennials as an exhibition form potentially going next. Yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I quite struggle with, with, with how to, you know, I initially did not want to mention the pandemic in the book at all, uh, although it is really, you know, my pandemic project. If it wasn't for, for pandemic, I don't know whether I would actually, you know, have the kind of focus and, and peace of mind to actually sit down and, and, and write something. But, um, but I don't, I, I tend to want to not give pandemic too much credit. I actually think we're already seeing that, you know, the travel is picking up. I think it was great moment of pause. And I think that, you know, biennials with the way, but, you know, as everything else has been accelerating at such a pace that we never really had a chance to stop and think about it. Like why are we doing it? I think it became the self-perpetuating system. And so I actually, it's a horrible thing to say, but I see a lot of positive things that are going to come out of it already. The fact that people are talking, that they're questioning, you know, who is our audience? For the first time, I actually see biennial directors, organizers meeting together and talking. It's like, but who we want to privilege? Because they suddenly were left without international audience. They still want to do something that is meaningful. And they realizing simply that, you know, their first primary audience is people who live within 25 miles away from the exhibition side. And I think that that is also, you know, they, they, we, we've seen completely unprecedented things. You know, I, I've heard, I don't remember which one, whether it was Taipei, something that I actually witnessed people installing shows via Zoom. So the artist was completely in another country. I have not seen anything like that before. And people were installing, following the instructions of a video, how to install the work. Yeah. So I think we're also learning that our things are, you know, that we thought were not possible are actually possible. Uh, what I think it's really interesting for me to see, and I think this is where the biggest disruption will happen, is also changing of the understanding of physicality of the exhibition space that now general public starts also understanding and being open more to the fact that there is the symbolic space and then there is the virtual exhibition space. Yes. And there is a lot of things that can happen in between. And that, and, and that also disrupts the time, right? Because the exhibition kind of opens and closes at certain time. But we suddenly start working with the tools that allow us to exhibition to be open 24 seven, that you know, that artists can, you know, we uh, audience can actually watch artist videos at home in their screen. So, so I think that there is definitely very interesting processes that I already see happening and changes. Uh, what I like about it is that people finally took a moment to think critically of what they're doing rather than self-perpetuating the exhibitions. I think whatever comes out of it, I, I, I'm really quite confident that that pause can be actually very beneficial for everyone. And I'm in a way not surprised you say that, Raphael, because I think what comes across for me really powerfully in your book is that desire for pause in general, for thinking, for standing back, for not just accepting newspaper reviews as the only form of you know, intelligent thought around the biennial as an exhibition form, but Absolutely. also your desire, your desire to sort of really look for the nuance and for diverse viewpoints. I mean, your book is very um, against simplistic binary attitudes in general, um, which I have to say I found, you know, thoroughly um, exciting to read. Let's throw open the questions because we've probably got about 10, 15 minutes left um, before people go off to their lunches, in your case, possibly supper in our case <laughs> um, in London. Um, and we have had a couple of questions in already. One of them, um, which we haven't talked about, although I was just about to start touching on it in that sort of last question about where things might go next. Obviously, the massive environmental uh, catastrophe that is not just coming our way, but as we've seen in Canada in the last few days is very much here in every part of the world now. Um, Caroline asks, how do you think biennial behaviours are going to change or are changing in response to carbon consciousness and what she says is flug scam, flight shame, um, and should they, should attitudes and behaviours change? I think they absolutely should and uh, but again 
I think that a lot of people jump into kind of conclusions about certain things uh, without looking a little bit deeper into research and into actually what is causing, what is the most, what are sort of the most kind of guilty parts of the exhibition uh, industry. And it's actually very surprising. I've been reading a lot of research, talking to people, you know, who recently been, been looking into that. And it's not the flights. Everybody thinks that it's traveling, you know, flying critics. It's not the flights, actually. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, but it's actually 90% of carbon footprint around, well, depending, you know, there are sort of two scientific studies that I found, but uh, it's air conditioning. It's no. air conditioning of exhibition spaces. Wow. That is responsible for over 90% of carbon footprint produced by biennials. So the recent uh, Taipei Biennial that was actually curated by uh, Bruno Latour and Martin Dinar. The, oh, I forgot the last name, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but I think that they're both brilliant curators and thinkers uh, of two different generations, but they also looked at, you know, they, I had the same feedback, they actually very clearly, you know, wanted to address the issues and took it really seriously into heart and did brilliantly. And, and it was the same conclusion that it, it is actually, the biggest problem there is the exhibition space itself and keep it in cool, especially in tropical climate. Oh, so, so that's something so I would never have given yeah. thought to. I mean, I know, I know from your days and mine at the Hayward Gallery and the other places that we both worked, the one thing that always horrified me, but it's probably relatively low on the carbon footprint, was the terrible waste, it seemed to me, of all of the building and destruction of walls constantly in exhibition spaces. You know, one show needs lots of temporary walls, the next one doesn't yes. need them, and, and there's never storage space to keep them, so they just get demolished and rebuilt again at great cost. But I mean, that is utterly fascinating and not It's definitely contributing, about. but if you think about biennials, especially that have dedicated buildings, as is the case in Taipei, but also, you know, uh, Guangzhou Biennial, yes. uh, Venice to, to lesser extent maybe, but, but you know, these are large, huge open spaces that need to be climate controlled. And a lot of them need to also be very climate controlled, especially if you start showing prints or photographs. Yes. And it's the same exactly that goes for large museum spaces. There is apparently such a wastage. So I guess if there's anything there, it's maybe some sort of lobbying system also for making sure that these buildings are as, as sealed as possible and, and, and that there is no wastage that may be reducing the time that the physical exhibition happens. But I think we really need to start looking at all different aspects before we kind of jump into conclusion that, that and start kind of flight shaming people because it's, this is really not the, 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 the worst impact, you know, as, as, as those first early studies show. That's a good call out to all eco architects out there. The challenge from Raphael to, to design the next amazing entire, entirely eco, environmentally sound uh, biennial. Well, I, I, and I think also with the pandemic, you know, uh, the, the Liverpool biennial that just opened last month, I mean, the entire exhibitions they were forced to do outside, but especially if you have in a moderate climate, you know, that's, that's another model that's been explored and, and, and it has biennials have been putting works outside and, uh, and obviously it does not sort of fit all types of works, et cetera. But, but I think it's also about creating, about enabling the dialogue with the artists very often, you know, and, and artists, there's so many artists that do amazing work that actually has to do with this broader notion of ecology and, yeah. and, 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 and deepening the understanding. So, so I think enabling artists actually to, to telling them that actually it's possible, you can do your art, so, you know, you can do it outside or you can do it somewhere else. Uh, I think that's already like a great first step. It's mm -hmm. really about enabling artists. I just think if, if biennials, if there is one thing that can really moving forward, thinking about the climate change, it's enabling to really think, you know, artists to do things a little bit differently and putting less constraints as we, as we all know, you know, whoever ever work at the gallery and had to read the health and safety manual, et cetera, et cetera, that there is a lot of constraints that are still there. Sure. We've had another question about what you feel is the impact of biennials these days on the cities that host them, you know, both for good and ill. 
Yeah, there is there is definitely an impact. There is definitely still a belief that a lot of city authorities have in the impact. You know, uh, I think perhaps on a European scale, Manifesta is a great example. This is this itinerant, but I know that every two years go to a different city. And and it's true that, you know, that it's it's I would say that show like Manifesta, which is really large scale and which really works, you know, Manifesta is a very unique model when when basically, you know, they have a sort of very lean structure, very small organization consisting maybe of, of 10, 12 people um, at their headquarters, and then they team and then they create local teams that they work with, that are local organizations. So it's a very interesting model and the way they, they work, you know, that they can create something of, of amazing scale with dozens of venues around the city. I would say that, you know, obviously it's not the same budgets as kind of, you know, uh, uh, having the football championship or the Olympics, but, but, but it's really making very, uh, very substantial impact also economically for the cities. And I think the city administrators and planners do understand that, especially, you know, with the introduction of creative economy and, and how believe whether we believe it or not that, you know, the creative class is the one who spends a lot of money, loves to consume by overpriced trainers and design objects. But uh, there is there is really still that belief. And again, do I believe in it personally? I don't know, but is it good? It's as, as long as the money is being spent on artists and art on art, I, I still think, you know, I see I see it as, as something positive. Yeah, well, Absolutely. actually, we have, we've had a question, in fact, back to that funding issue about not really how much you know how the how the biennials themselves are individually funded but whether in your experience the biennials are able to sort of unlock funding or raise money for artist projects that might otherwise not have been available absolutely and this is this is one of the you know biennials are also brands today and they obviously part of that big economy um uh, and uh, so, so the, the, there is definitely, you know, something that this is something that an artist, especially emerging artist, wants to put on the CV, and it's something that can enable uh, uh, that it can enable that funding to happen. Especially, you know, very often biennials uh, are very ambitious in the beginning, and then when it comes to production, I mean, many galleries do that too. Uh, then, then it kind of falls short, and 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 it's true that it's much easier for an artist or somebody who's helping them and representing them to actually approach the funders and say, well, this project has been selected, you know, for the biennials. So if you help us, you're also gonna get that exposure. So it's definitely something that I, I've seen many times now that it's a very strong asset for an artist to just be featured in a in a biennial. We have and biennials themselves, yeah, sorry, and, and just to add, yeah. uh, just to finish on that, but then biennials increasingly, and this is another amazing uh, development, that biennials, you, you know, there are a few that, that kind of been championing that, including Liverpool, for example, in the UK, uh, seeing themselves as incubators and as producers. So the biennials, yeah. you know, there's even kind of unspoken competition between biennials, it's like, oh, we have 70% of works are newly commissioned projects, you know, or we have only 50, but next year we're gonna have 80. There is definitely this idea that Biennial becomes a producer of artworks and not only a place where artworks being shipped showcased, uh, to be yes. showcased, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Raphael, just a very final question. Um, you have obviously worked for years in and around biennials. You did your PhD on them. You've written this polemical book. You're the director of the Biennial Foundation. You're sort of the biennial king. Um, what is it about this form of exhibition making that particularly appeals to you? Uh, I think it's been extremely dynamic. I think it's really, for me, it was about, you know, seeing over past 25 years really in front of our eyes as, as it was contributing to reshaping the art world and how art world was changing. And again, I don't want to give Biennials too much credit. There are so many other things that happened to it. But at the same time, I think they need to be acknowledged. They also need to be acknowledged for their contribution to, uh, to bring in many different knowledges and making contemporary art much more interdisciplinary. 
and at the same time giving artists legitimacy to make epistemic claims to to actually contribute and participate in the in the discussions biennial has been doing it very successfully since you know since early editions of Havana bringing activists bringing uh, scientifics bringing academics together with artists talking a lot of talking has been happening uh, this is also an amazing process to see that you know there are now biennials that actually are all about talking not about exhibitions but they actually do more discursive uh, 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 events that that exhibitions themselves so so for me, it was about that. It was also about, I think, the way they contributed to taking the art outside of the walls and, and, and kind of ending that, that reign and privilege of White Cube. Even though a lot of people, especially in the early days and, and, and people that I enormously uh, respect wrote about how biennials actually perpetuated White Cube around the world, which is also a good argument that did also happen. Uh, but but I think biennials had capacity that museums and some commercial galleries did not have mm -hmm. to literally create impossible to put an artwork in the middle of busy intersection in a city or in a subway station and make people and make artists imagine things that really were not kind of on the radar before and and for me this is what continuously really drives me and you know and, and and even though being completely blasé after i've seen all these biennials and stuff i still go sometimes uh, you know to japan to discover that show by pure week and i'm just completely speechless you know so so i think biennials keep surprising me and i just hope it continues well i have to say your book thoroughly surprised me at many turns and it's sort of First of all, when it arrived from Lovely Lucy, because I was sort of expecting it to be some enormous, unwieldy, you know, like the classic art book. And I love the fact that it's a sort of pocket book that you can read um, on your way to work or, you know, um, in the park or whatever. Thank you so much. There's so much more we could talk about, but I think we'll probably leave it there. Um, and I would just encourage people to, to read the book and to take up Raphael's sort of, um, you know, critical position for positive and negative to really encourage us to think more seriously about this art form and you know, Absolutely. positives as well as as well as sort of pulling it apart so that it can and what I always generation and what I always advocate you know the the most people especially from Europe they first contact it's always Venice or Documenta but I would want to encourage everybody to do a little bit of research there is the Biennial Foundation website there are other resources out there try to discover smaller biennials in different parts of the world they're everywhere in europe or in asia or in latin america it's it there is just such amazing diversity and ecosystem there is really something for everybody i think there and and, and that that would be if i can contribute to you know somehow inspiring that curiosity in people to kind of look be, beyond documenta and beyond venice and those biennials who actually kind of monopolize the attention of, of especially of art press that, that that would be for me something really uh gratifying thank you very much thank you very much to jackie and to Raphael for a really thank you, interesting thought-provoking um conversation and i and thank you Raphael, for opening our eyes about the contemporary biennial i think we'll all be sort of looking out with interest to see how biennials re-emerge from the pandemic um yeah, so the book, I'll hold it up again, if you can see it here, um, is available to buy from lundhumphreys.com if this discussion has whetted your appetite. Um, and we have a special offer code, which I'll give you again, Biennials20, which will give you 20% off the book from our website. And that's only available till the 11th of July. So um, hurry to get that. Um, you can also, if you go onto our website, you can find more information about the New Directions in Contemporary Art series and the books that are coming up there. And you can sign up to our email newsletter if you're interested in hearing about new books or coming to new uh, more events like this. Um, we've recorded this event, so we'll be in touch with you when the recording is available um, to share with you. And thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Ralph.